Joined here today by Denver Police Division Chief Joe Montoya to talk about the idea of start by believing. And this is a concept that's been around for years now. Full disclosure, I participated in a PSA campaign with you guys on this concept of start by believing as it relates to sexual assault claims. Tell people what that concept means. Well, that concept, uh, first I want to get back to where it was, it was started, was uh, in violence on women, against women uh, international. And it was brought to Denver uh, in 2015, and then we launched in 2016. And what it is, it's a campaign, it's, it's really geared towards the community, uh, the support basis for victims, uh, potential victims, to have a, a safe space or someone that they can talk to. And we, we want to foster that, uh, the um, environment of support for these victims so that, they're, that when they make that outcry that they, they at least feel they're going to be believed on the front end. Because we, we know, the research shows, that there will be people who come forward with claims and it's a, a friend or a family member who discourages them from taking it any further, and then it never gets to you guys. What does start by believing mean to your officers and your investigators? Well, it's, start by believing, and from a law enforcement standpoint, is, is something that we've always embraced. Uh, not only with sex crimes, but with any kind of report that we get. You always, you're a fact finder. You go out and you start by believing what, what the person is telling you. And then you, you let the investigation and all the fact finding things that you do build upon that initial information to determine what you have. When you start by believing an alleged victim, does that mean that you are starting by believing that the accused is guilty? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It, it, it means that we give credibility to what the victim is telling us at that time because we want them to feel free to, to give us the story. The more facts we have, the better investigation that we can do. If they're, if they're hesitant to tell us everything, if they're holding things back out of fear or doubt, that doesn't, that doesn't help with the investigation. Uh, then we let the investigation take place, and there's several steps to that that uh, would help us determine whether or not the information we're getting on the front end is something that we can move forward with uh, as far as uh, into the court process. I want to ask you something that I, I haven't ever heard discussed when it comes to start by believing. Do you start by believing the accused when you go to interview the accused? We do not. We do not always. I mean, it, by the time we, we get to talking to the accused, we usually have a body of information to work on. Now, I can't say that we always disbelieve them because if we have information that doesn't corroborate the information we have from, from the victim, then we would take to what, what they're saying into account and that might sway the, the decision in the end. But if we have information that, that, that would corroborate that they, they committed the crime, we're definitely not going in starting to believe what they're saying. So we're gonna try to discredit what they're saying. One of the most striking things that I ever heard about Start By Believing, and one of the reasons why I agreed to participate in that PSA campaign years ago, was that the organizers were saying, we really want to get the message out to the public, that if somebody tells you that something terrible happened, don't assume they're going to tell somebody else. That you may think, well, you know what, I'm a distant friend. You know, or I just, I happened to be there one, one night when he or she had a drink or two and decided to share this. Surely they've told other people. You encourage people in the community to not have that mindset. Correct, correct. We, we can't have that mindset. It does, it does no good for the community to, to foster an environment where people are afraid to come forward with that kind of information. Because if, if someone, if a victim truly is afraid to come forward because they feel they're gonna, they're gonna meet barriers within their own support base or their friends, they're not gonna report. And they're gonna carry that with them their entire lives. And, and the trauma is never healed until you get some sort of treatment for it. So you never know where that's gonna lead somebody. And it just leads to a more unhealthy society in general. Do you encounter a lot of false sexual misconduct claims? It's very infrequent, very infrequent. Do you, are you confident in your ability to suss those out? We are very, very confident. Uh, do the fake claims tend to have common characteristics? Uh, they, well, not necessarily. I think right now it's, it's, much, it's much easier for us to actually vet them because of, mostly because of the electronics that people are using now. There's generally uh, some sort of... Um, uh, a trail? A trail, or, yeah. yeah, a trail. There's, there's timelines, there's information, there's uh, communications 
that sometimes we can go back and it would kind of discredit what they're saying, especially uh, sometimes if it's portrayed as a stranger, stranger type deal, like I don't, never met a person and such, and then we determine there's a long-term relationship there. So those types of things make it easier for us to, to vet that. I think in years back, it would have been more based on what one person is saying versus another. I didn't invite you here to weigh in on a national case. Yeah. but I know that a lot of cases share similarities. So I want to ask you, how does DPD approach it when you have a situation where you have a seemingly credible person who accuses somebody else of, of sexual assault or something of the like, and you have a credible denial? And you have no other evidence to work with, no corroboration. You just have two people who are seeming, seemingly convincing uh, sharing their stories. Where do you go with that? Well, you, you do the full-scale investigation, which would include trying to find witnesses. You look at the timeline and try to corroborate what's being said. You look at uh, any electronic evidence, you look at any physical evidence. And we have a very comprehensive review system with the DA's office. Sex crimes are the only crimes that are, have a dual review process through the DA's office. Why is that? I think because they're such sensitive crimes. They're, they're crimes where I believe that victims, again, feel like they, it's the only crime in which the victim sometimes seems to get the blame put back on them. So I think for that reason, they, we want to make sure that when these cases are being declined for prosecution, that there are two sets of eyes in that, uh, in that field that are looking at it and making those decisions. So it's not just based on one person's uh, decision making. That way, I, I think you can get past that you know, maybe this person had uh, a certain feeling or I hate to say it biased, but maybe they had a feeling towards this case that, that caused them to decline it. Do you have a second set of eyes that looks at it? And if they can confirm that, I think it makes for a stronger case either way. When you guys have that situation where you have somebody making a sexual assault claim and somebody denying it, and you, you look for any corroboration and you just don't find it, you take those to prosecutors? We do. We, we take everything to the DA's office for, for a, an official decline of, uh, to further it into the crime, uh, a criminal justice system. Um, now, it doesn't stop there. If, if in those cases that we can't prove it, it will not move forward into the judicial system. However, we still have our victim's resources available, and we, we still will interact with this victim to give them the services they need to help them process through what, what happened to them. Even if their alleged assailant isn't prosecuted, they, they still qualify as a victim? They do. Lastly, the whole country is talking about this idea of reporting sexual assault when and how to report it, how to react, that kind of thing. What do you hope the takeaway is, politics aside, from this national focus? I hope that, that victims uh, start feeling more comfortable, that there are less barriers in their way to, to step forward and, and, and bring that information forward to, to law enforcement so that we can, we can take a look at it and not only to serve that victim in the community, but you might be looking at a potential suspect that has harmed other people or could potentially harm other people. And if you have a, that people that, uh, victims that are not reporting, that's more dangerous to our community. So what I really hope to see come from it is just that these victims feel comfortable to come forward in whatever format, because we've, we've introduced other formats, the Seek Then Speak format, which uh, allows them to make a report without having to talk to a person. They could do it online. Um, they can choose to go into the hospital and have uh, uh, the SANE kit, the sex uh, assault nurses conduct there and choose not to make a report. But uh, nonetheless, it, it gives them avenues at their comfort level to come forward and bring the information to us. All right, DPD Division Chief Joe Montoya, thank you for your time, appreciate it. Thank you.